Welcome to All About Art. My name is Alexandra, and I'm an art historian, curator, and writer. Within this podcast, topics relating to art history, cultural policy, the art sector, as well as a large range of other art-related topics will be covered. Conducting critical discussions, having entertaining exchanges, or just enjoying some relaxing chats? All About Art is where you'll find it all. Join me in exploring and developing cultural discourse. Welcome to another episode of All About Art, where I interview COO and co-founder of Artscapey, Emilia D'Astasio, about founding a startup that is by art collectors for art collectors and uses the combination of art and technology. Emilia has been an avid art collector for the past decade and has developed her love of art through visiting local art exhibitions and going to museums. She did this while working as an economist at the European Central Bank and then as a venture capitalist who would invest in tech startups. A few years ago, she decided to launch a company together with her partner, Alessandro, that married both her expertise in finance and tech, as well as her love and her appreciation for art. Stay tuned to hear me chat to Amelia about the company and what the gaps were within the arts in terms of collecting and technology that needed to be filled. We also talk about what is needed if you want to scale a company and make a startup grow within the arts, as well as what the important questions are to ask yourself when speaking to investors. We also chat about personal topics, such as what it was like founding a company with her husband and what her day-to-day looks like. Thank you so much to Amelia for coming on the podcast, and thank you to Artscapey for the collaboration. And now, on to the interview. All right, Emilia, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I am just going to dive right into the first question, and that is, let's start with a bit about you. Can you tell me and our lovely listeners a bit about your background, your education, and possibly your early career path? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, I'm very glad to to be here with you, Alex. Um, Yeah, I've been looking forward to doing this, so, so yeah, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, about my background, I guess it's it's been quite a journey. So I started actually in economics, in finance. It's what I studied. So I did my, my bachelor's in the US and then I moved to the UK. Uh, and then after that, I went into basically financial services. So I've been across the board also there. So I started in public institutions. Um, I was at the European Central Bank, so I spent a year in Germany as well. And then I went into to private sector, so I worked at Moody's, always doing more or less financial or economic research, which is quite different from looking at yeah, startups or working at a startup or being in, in arts, but we'll get to that. But yeah, I got interested in, in thinking about not just how do markets move, but what are those underlying forces that make markets move? So what, where does the innovation come from? Who are the, the drivers of those things? And that curiosity combined with wanting to meet with more people and be more exposed to the economy and to, to, uh, to speaking more with people. Um, I got into the world of startups, so looking into investing into startups, so the venture capital side of things, uh, which I found really, really exciting. So that really combines a bit of this research, understanding a project quite comprehensively, so really researching also the market and understanding, does this company have a place in yeah. where the market is, is yeah. heading. So not only the company and getting to know the company, but getting to know the market that the company would exactly. sit within. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that got me into yeah startups, and that's how I got into, let's say, technology side of things. But then at the same time, um, I've always been interested in art. So, and now with my with my now husband, we're, we're quite keen collectors. We've been actively collecting since almost a decade at this point. And it was basically one of those where it was a lockdown baby, basically, our scapey, what oh, we're really? doing now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So 
Same with all about art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it was, um, you know, we've been collecting and we were getting tired of, of a lot of the um, frustrations that I think come with it today. So I think it's a, quite an intimidating world, you know, stepping into to, to a gallery, especially when you don't come from an art background. 100%, yourself. yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so as much as, as we want to say, yeah, the door is open, but it's quite an intimidating experience and you have, you almost get a bit of imposter syndrome. You feel like there's a lot of stigma, I think, that comes in to the art world, whether we want it or not. And the same with, with just finding information. I mean, it's hard to to understand as an outsider how to access good quality art yeah so definitely so I think uh, what a lot of people think and probably what I thought if you asked me 10 years ago was yeah okay but you have to go into one of the big auction houses so you go into Sotheby's and you sit there with your five million in the bank and you bid and that's how you get into contemporary art yeah but it doesn't have to be like that no that can't be further from the truth exactly yeah and and you know it took us 10 years to arrive at that point and and so that's what I wanted to, that's what we wanted to change. We wanted to allow more people to access and explore quality contemporary art, fine art. Yeah. And that's where, where Artscapey comes into, comes into the picture. So it's, it's a nice combination of basically a passion and then this um, experience in, in technology or looking at startups or thinking about how to create a business so having been on the other side of basically questioning everything so I think Alessandro is the is more the he is the ideator and I'm the the one that's looking at poking holes at that idea <laughs> <laughs> and then together what a perfect we make combination it. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. Yeah. laughs> so someone is is you know in in the clouds while I'm, I'm poking holes at the cloud and then we still manage to float so yeah <laughs> Gosh, but that's so important. But I, it completely resonates because I am a contemporary art collector. However, I'm an art historian. Mm. I've worked at Sotheby's for four years. I know what the art market looks like to a certain extent. I understand where I can go to go collect contemporary art because, you know, I went to UCL, which is right, you know, with Slade. And so I understand that I can go to like graduate shows and, and I can do it personally because I work in the sector. Yeah. But if I didn't work in the sector, I wouldn't know where to begin. Yeah, and exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't understand that I could be purchasing things for, for under under 300, under 3,000. Exactly, exactly. Within any budget, really. Yeah. And so I think that that's really important because... I think that what leads to the art world being so intimidating at times is its lack of opacity. Uh, sorry, lack of transparency. Yeah, it is exactly. its opacity. Yeah. So it's very much the the fact that you cannot find this information. You don't know everything that that comes into collecting and all the things that you need to consider. But before we continue, for example, because that would be a, a good time to talk about the collection management system. However, before we dive into that, sure. can you tell me more about Artscapey and its mission? And how does it inform the way that you do business, for example, in terms of conducting due diligence? And how are you approaching making an impact on the arts? Yeah, so so this is a, a good question. And I think it flows quite easily nicely from what we were talking about before so our key mission is exactly this to remove the opacity of the art market and and basically removing that that intimidation those barriers to entry really for people to access quality art because i think also from the artist's perspective they want to be explored they want to make an impact and they're focused on their works but as as someone who loves art it's hard to enter, and and that's what we wanted to to get around. So our our mission is really this: to democratize fine art collecting, so make it more uh, accessible for people, and that's why we built Artscapey. So Artscapey is really, I would say, even the first platform that is fully dedicated to the collector. So we put the collector at the center. And we try to build something that caters to all the the needs of a collector. So be that, you know, growing and managing your collection, exploring 
art from selected galleries. So, so also there, we want to really set the bar in, in terms of a, of a quality experience. So we're working only with very selected galleries. You know, these kind of places where they're pouring their heart and soul into putting together a really nice artist program, but they might not be able to, to reach the same scale of, of knowledge men in the art market. And it, it's exactly these kind of great galleries of research that we're, we're working with and we're happy to be working with now. And then we, we work also in terms of blockchain. So I think blockchain can have a really nice support for the, for the art world. Uh, so probably, I mean, most of your listeners know this, but, you know, whenever you buy an artwork, you know, it can come with a certificate of authenticity. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and this, if it comes with that, usually it's this piece of A4 paper um, that, you know, I could spill my, my coffee on. Yeah. Um, it could be lost. You could, yeah, you could forget it somewhere <laughs> yeah. in, in a move. It just ends up in the recycling exactly. on accident. <laughs> exactly. But that piece of paper can almost be worth as much as the artwork itself because that's your way to certify, you know, that it's authentic. Yeah. So what better what a better thing than to put that on, on blockchain? So this database essentially that becomes immutable, uh, allows you to track the the provenance. Also, the provenance track is is hugely important in the art world. Mm. So it's a great tool, I think, mm. to to add transparency and and support the art world. So that's tra- what we're trying to do. So basically, it's one overall platform that centers on the on the collector. So also, there we're working a lot in terms of the editorial side. So a bit of guides on thinking about these aspects that you talked about. So how, how do I even get into to collecting? How do I know a bit of the background, learn a bit about the artist, but in a non-intimidating way? So we're never trying to... This is also what I struggle with a lot. Um, not, not everywhere, but a lot of also the writing around the uh, art can 100%. feel 100% can feel quite, 100%. <laughs> can feel yeah. quite intimidating. And, yeah. you know, you're using very big words uh, in, 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 as an outsider, again, it becomes quite difficult to match uh, that experience. So, of course, that's an educational barrier because not everyone has had access to the education that may allow us to be, you know, when I studied at, at, at UCL, that really changed the way that I, I, I write. And sometimes I do notice that my writing can be incredibly academic. And I think that that's something that I also really make an effort to do with the podcast is when I speak, I don't have to speak in terms exactly. of like, I, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what a certain word means or everyone knows what a certain term is. I want to be able to explain that in simpler terms so that it's easier to understand so that at least one type of barrier, it might be a language barrier or an educational barrier, who knows, but anyone can can be struggling with that and no matter what background you've come from and I think that it really is difficult and can put people off exactly. of actually engaging with the works intellectually yeah yeah because what we're seeing with all these people so actually when we started Artscape it was basically a hobby project yeah because we said look we're, we're fed up with this it's hard to to find the right kind of tools information can I ask, what were you using before? All, all, all kinds of things. I mean, we yeah. had one, one couple of, uh, I mean, we were using Excel mostly oh, for, yeah. to manage okay. the collection. Okay, but then, ahead. you know, you also look at standalone services for that. Yeah. You go to um, various other price database sites to, to look a bit of background. You, you read around, I mean, all these scattered websites, basically. But yeah. it becomes a very demanding journey if I have to, to to understand one thing about a new artist you have to go to five six seven different places to understand so actually yeah. the the funny point is we were looking at a at a Nara print that was coming through from from a friend who's working as an art advisor and we you know we wanted to have a bit more information about this artist but you realize 
that one we weren't able to to talk to other other collectors because also that is something that seems to be a thing of the the market that collectors are not always in the same circle so we wanted to also help co- connect different different collectors so just to find a bit more information about Nara you you had to search all these different sites okay is this a good place to to find that information and we said okay no this is this is enough we're gonna build off of our um, experience a bit in in technology so so knowing a bit where to go to find these kind of uh, initial tools so let's just build something for us and, and and a couple of friends to basically manage our collection and and maybe do a couple of articles something like this but then the more we talk to people the more we mentioned it to to other friends galleries they said look you have to do this on yeah, a bigger you discovered scale. a gap in the market yeah and it just really snowballed from there yeah like uh, like nothing else it was it was kind of that classic startup story you start in the <laughs> in the basement and you think ah oh, this is not gonna go anywhere and then all of a sudden you have a team of, of 15 people yeah and uh, and you know we're we're really hoping to make an impact now yeah yeah so we were talking about collection management. Yeah. Can you tell me and the listeners a bit more about this collection management system? Because I would like to know how something like that works. I mean, I personally do because I've used your your collection management system. Mm. But maybe delve in to it a little bit more about why it's useful for the everyday art collector. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, no. So so I think it's it's nice in the sense of having a one place to to store your your information so we built basically a system where one you can upload everything in one go um, you don't have to enter everything one by one you have all the information it's encrypted so you can be sure that it's all all safely stored and you have full basically privacy control over it so also there we thought of the aspects of maybe you want to share some parts of your collection with friends so also buy basically buckets of data so you can have let's say the, the general information about the artwork so the artwork title artist etc maybe those things you want to share with friends or your art advisor you can and then still store the rest of the information so provenance maybe if there's been restoration um, invoices, this kind of thing, you can still store that in one place and keep that separately, privately, just for yourself. Yeah. And then having just a nice overview of the images. So what you're missing in in Excel is, it sounds like a good solution, but then when you get into it, it becomes very messy very quickly. Oh yeah, definitely. And you don't see the images either. So yeah. here you can have a basically a big catalog of your collection yeah and then we've added so building again a bit on our business and finance backgrounds we wanted to help bring in some analytical tools so you can see i love those i, love I mean those. i think they are great because yeah. you you discover things that you didn't think about before so you yeah. can segment a bit your collection see by medium or by year of purchase year of of uh, production by the different artists, but also by value. Yeah, so that's how, much... how I have it. Which I mean, I guess that was the default setting in the in the beginning because I yeah. haven't I haven't played around with it um, too much. But I want to slowly start putting all of my collected artworks on Artscapey so that I can see and really have this good overview of yeah. what's in my collection. Yeah, it's great. I yeah, it's nice to hear you say that. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, I think it was again, it was a tool that we felt we needed so yeah. we really built it off of that and what i what i like as well is i mean you can add also market value so say that there's been uh, you know an auction or you have like a multiple and that multiple has been sold and you you have a reference point of a value you can add that in and you have an overview graph that shows the value of your collection and that will update then so you can see also track the value of your collection over time. So also as you sell things, it will automatically show you, you know, if you if you made any gain on that sale, uh, if, if you do that. But equally, yeah, if there's been a change in value that will be there basically automatically, which I think is quite 
quite neat because it gives you also that side of collecting. So some people look at art from a more of an investment angle. And so for them, it can be useful to have those kind of informations um, yeah. displayed. I mean, I don't even look at art collecting from an investment point of view. I mean, well, I do and I don't because I don't look at it from an investment point of view in the sense of of monetary investment mm-hmm. um, or monetary gain. It's more that I, when I collect something now, I really look at, do I believe in what this artist is doing? Mm-hmm. Um Am I investing in in their career as well, in in supporting them and putting my monetary contributions towards something yeah. that encourages the arts to to unfold and to continue? And so even then, I do think it's interesting for me to still know what's going on in my collection and have that overview because I have artworks that I can't display because I don't have enough space. And so I do exactly. have them stored. Yeah. And I have artworks in a different country, yeah. in my hometown. Yeah. And so it's really nice to just have more of an overview. Yeah. And yeah. to understand what's what's happening in my collection. It's not like I don't know what's going on, but it's still so good because you can look at it from all these different angles to cater to how you invest. Mm. So either investing in artists because you're investing in their careers and what they believe in or investing for for monetary purposes as well or a combination of the two. Yeah. The yeah, so I think I think the, the way the way I mean I've I've only met two kinds of of collectors so one collector that probably wants to make money so it's a bit more of an investment angle to it yeah but then equally the people who do it purely for the love of art they also don't want to lose money at the end of the day no so but that there is that I mean it's it's inherent in the journey that there is a financial element to it Mm -hmm. so tracking that helps you be be more aware yeah. Um, and, and also there is something as that you help new collectors to to be aware of, really. And also they on the on the side of location of things. I mean, that's something we also put in there so you can see where your your artworks are located, what kind of if they're in a storage or yeah. if you've done any work with them, uh, framers um so you really can have an overview because I think that's one of the reasons why we have technology, right? So technology is there to help improve and facilitate your life. And and that's what we're hoping to do. So using technology to help you collect easier and do it safer. I mean, have the the, the data in one place. So also there, if you're using an Excel, yeah, your computer can crash tomorrow unless you're doing, yeah, of course, um, cloud backups, etc. But yeah. With our solution, you already have it in the cloud. Yeah. I mean, and with your solution, it's not only this this aspect of backing up, but it's generally just the whole smooth process mm-hmm. that your system offers. It's so easy. I couldn't imagine trying to take care of my collection or try and document my collection through Excel. I wouldn't have even done it because it was too much of a faff. Exactly. Like, no point. But the way that you have structured it and the way that the database works it's I find it great so yeah (laughs) um but on to my next question how was it being in venture capitalist investing and in tech compared to running a business in the arts and I'm talking more about what is the difference between the two sectors but also what are the similarities big questions there (laughs) yeah um (laughs) Yeah, so, so when I was doing the, the investment, it was across different sectors. So looking at technology for advertising, but also software as a service, digital consumer products, so invested in a, in a fitness app. So very broad scope. Um, I mean, there, there are some similarities and there are various frameworks that you tend to follow and you understand so everything from the market potential, what's the target market, how are they approaching it, what kind of team is running it, how are they looking at the go-to-market strategy, this kind of thing. So there is this this thinking, which is quite broad, and you apply to each startup that you're looking at. But then being on the other side of running that, of course, you're, you're, you're focusing on that one project that you're trying to do. 
So I think for me, the most helpful thing is I can already ask myself or ask us the, the typical questions. So when we started it, it's like, okay, well, but what's the price point going to be? Why, how is this going to be different from competitors? These kind of classic questions that are good to be, be aware of as you, as you grow it, as you build it. And we can already anticipate a lot of those questions as we, as we go forward. So when we're speaking with, with investors now, it, it helps a lot because then I'm already aware of what those questions can come because I've been on the other side and, and I have that feeling for how a lot of the things that we talk about could be perceived. So it sounds very grand that we have a quite an ambitious roadmap ahead, which often can be perceived by investors saying, oh, but you're trying to do too much. But, okay. but in, our, in our sense, we can say, look, but we've already delivered all those things. We did all these things ahead of time which helps to de-risk that side. So venture capital is all about risk. So mm-hmm. it's, it's one of the riskiest investments you can ever do. Most startups fail. So what your job as the entrepreneur is, is to help de-risk that. So show that you can do it. You have the right people, you approach it in the right way. And you are very conscious of how the market is moving. You quite firmly try to establish uh, unique parts of your business that's going to make it stand out. Mm. So having that kind of dual mindset has been really helpful yeah. so far. Yeah, because you know which boxes you need to have exactly. and then you need to you then also know how to tick those boxes. Yeah. That's really interesting because I think that uh, there are so many different ways to approach this intersection of sectors. And for me from an art historical point of view looking at technology and how artists use technology, that's incredibly interesting as Mm -hmm. well. And so just thinking about how these different approaches really mesh together and how sometimes I think that our sector, like the arts, Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's because I've only really been in the arts. So I'm saying it may not be particular to our sector, but it feels that way that within the arts, people are very protective of this is what the arts is. Yeah, And this is not allowed to go into any other outside sectors. We're not allowed to mesh. Mm-hmm. And so it was the same thing when, when I was doing art business at UCL. I was president of the Art Business Society. And I just remember someone, it was actually a, a professor, saying to me, why are you doing this when we have tried to separate art and business for the past century? You know, we've been trying to not make it revolving around money or anything like that. And what I then said was, well, but that doesn't help anybody if you stigmatize having to adhere to the way that our world works. Mm -hmm. Like, I want artists to be successful. I want to grow the sector. I want the cultural and creative industries. But the arts and cultural industries within the cultural and creative industries to really grow and that takes people doing startups it takes people thinking of new ways to grow the sector and then it takes people who then create jobs through their startups yeah yeah. which is what you've done yeah yeah and I I I couldn't I couldn't agree more so I think also there so arts is enormously important for the development of society so artists Uh, one uh, one of the key I think also predictors forecasters uh, of of how society is moving, they they reflect many times on things we haven't even perceived yet. Yeah. So how many times have you not seen an artist that you know foresaw something? They're they're I think they're at the forefront of of science in many ways, social science, but even natural science. So so a lot of people, a lot of artists that I've met with, you know, they will collaborate with science institutions. And they run various kind of projects, uh, experiments. So they help drive society forward. But to do that, they they should have an impact. They should be allowed to have an impact on society. And the way you do that is through collecting. I mean, you as, as an individual can help bring those thoughts forward. I think it's a bit back to what you were saying before when you're 
looking at artists is also do I believe in what they're trying to do? Yeah. Do I do I support the kind of messaging that they're trying to bring forward? What are they what are they leaving for what kind of legacy are they leaving? What kind of storytelling are they giving? What kind of an opinion are, are they putting down for us to, to to see and to be impacted by me? There's a lot of non-artist yeah. people yeah let's say you know we're very much stuck in, well not stuck but we follow our way of life right so we yeah. don't see it the way a lot of artists see so what one thing that i love with artists is they have a way to see the world in a completely different way they truly do yeah which is which is so mind-blowing yeah and therefore they should be also listened to they're yeah. also heard in the market and the way you do that is opening the art world so I think a lot yeah. of people are interested in in art you see it already now people artists are, are being able to sell across Instagram on a, on a global scale yeah and a lot of people are, are interested in it I think it, it needs to be there so the art world I think has been one of the industries that has been still behind the, the digital or the technological curve and that's where we want to also help to push that forward um, because I think it's it's something that people want, and I also think it's good for the art world. So we were just talking about how you've grown the company and mm-hmm. how you've now you now have a team. So what has the timeline looked like from inception of the idea for Artscapey up until now? Because you have been able to scale the company and grow. And so how have you achieved that? Uh, yeah, so it's been quite a journey. So we started, um, yeah, it was about July 2020. By October, we had already incorporated and had the very first alpha version of the platform already by yeah, by November, essentially, which is extremely fast in, in startup world. Um, but I think it's because we were building off of those experiences of... Yeah having been in that world, knowing how to approach things. We were then looking into investment at the same time that we were growing the platform. We started to hire the first people in the beginning of 2021. And we closed the first round in March in 2021. And we did our next round already in in July. And we've actually managed to raise one million. So far, which has been amazing. Yeah, that was quite a quite a quite a journey as well. But it's been great to see. I think that's a testament to what we were saying just before that. I think there's an enormous opportunity to bring the art world to more people. So yeah. making collecting and access to the art world more accessible. So democratizing it, and that has really resonated also with investors, which we are humbled by and and absolutely happy with, um, which has been great to have that kind of confidence also from that side of thing. Then, then yeah, I mean, the, the project itself grows and things inherently are quite chaotic in the beginning of a, of a startup as you, you find your, as you find your way, your, your really, your, your strategy, as, as it were, you trial a couple of different things. And, and see what resonates really with the market. I mean, we've been always quite firm. I mean, our, our North Star, our guiding thought has always been to build something for collectors. So it's really one of those things where, you know, the founders are trying to solve their own problems. And when you try to do that, you become very sharp in the ultimate uh, goal of, of the platform and yeah. of what we're trying to achieve. But then it's about finding your way a bit as you go. We were lucky to to find a really great technical lead, basically our CTO, mm-hmm. who has a lot of experience in in the tech world, so building platforms and 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 taking over the development side of things. And it's really about having great people on board. So what we're really trying to do there, and one thing that we've been very firm with is also bringing in people from the art world yeah because also there as as a founder I I recognize that I don't have that academic background but it's important that we we have that and we resonate with that 
Yeah. So we've made it a firm point to always bring in people who come from the art world and have, you know, an art background, who studied art academically. Yeah. Into into all the non tech roles, so we we're a bit softer on the tech side because then you you reduce the pool quite a bit if you're trying to find a developer who's done blockchain and also an art degree. Yeah. So we said okay, <laughs> yeah, there are well, very few people <laughs> who fit that criteria. So we said okay, let's 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 allow a bit of uh, flexibility on that yeah. angle. But you know, any anything non tech. We really try to keep that very set on understanding the art world. Yeah. So be that uh, we have a couple of team members who who are collectors themselves, or who who became collectors as a as a result of joining the joining the company, and and, and equally we are we are very proud and happy to have uh, amazing team members who are also from from Sotheby's, yeah. from Goldsmiths, from from all these kind of great art institutions. Because I think you you do need that, yeah, right? So one hundred percent. Also, as a founder, you need to find people that complement the things that you can do, so help you achieve that that goal and staying true to the art. So yeah, I think one I of the I completely agree. Like I could not agree with you more on this, and I think it's great. Like it's so important. Yeah, because a lot of people. So what we've seen also. I mean, in the art market now, there's a lot of people trying to do something because they've a bit realized this same thing. The art world is a bit behind the digitalization curve. There's a lot of room for technology to make a positive impact. Yeah. But that means that you have a lot of people seeing this, but they might not stay true to the art angle for it. So I've seen a few projects where that really shines out that you know you have to also be conscious of how does the art world work yeah and that's really something we're trying to do which is why we're trying to always speak to as many people as we can visit galleries on the on the weekends uh, go to art fairs what are the pain points of the of those people in the art world what matters more how do we approach that in the right way yeah because otherwise you yeah you're building something maybe for the art world but it isn't going to be what they are looking no, for. Exactly. Something that also adds to that is that, for example, you mentioned Sotheby's and that you have someone who, who was at Sotheby's and they then reached out and, for example, connected me with Arts yeah, And yeah. so it really is coming and, and getting people who also know other people. Exactly. That sounds so basic, but how important exactly, is it exactly. to get the word out yeah. and to get these different opinions and to get these different people on board to assist or write or advise or exactly. everything and yeah. to collaborate. Yeah. And that's the really wonderful thing about it. Yeah, I think this has been super beautiful. I'm, I'm I'm super happy to have gotten to know you through this through this exact uh, kind of route. But you have yeah. to be open to that, and you have to try to to seek it. Also. Exactly. So you founded Artscapey with your partner Alessandro. Yeah. How has that been working with your partner to build a startup in the arts, and I mean in lockdown as well. And because, you know, many use the saying that you shouldn't mix personal and professional. So what would you say yeah. to, to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously it's an it's an intense one, but I mean, <laughs> equally, equally, yeah, don't don't mix the things. But equally, what they always say is, you know, pick your pick your 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 fellow founder, your co-founder in the right way, because you'll end up spending more time with your co-founder than with your spouse. Well, he <laughs> happens to be my spouse, so. Oh my God, I love that. I love that, yeah. You do spend more time at work than you do at home. Exactly. So make sure that your coworkers are, you know, that you get along and that you feel good. Yeah, and to be honest, if it was another way around and, and you know, we weren't working together, I think things would have been extremely tough because you, you do spend a lot of time, a lot of mental energy on this project. I think... There are a couple of things that go into this mix because it's quite a dynamic situation to be in. I think the biggest thing you have to try to do to make this work is separate what is what is work and what is not work. Yeah. So when we are in the when we're in the office, we are not husband and wife, not at all. 
we are two co-founders. We have different we have different views, we have different opinions, we have different ways of seeing things. And we try to not shy away from, you know, calling each other out or um, you know, voicing those those opinions. So it, it should be really clear that there is no special treatments and or that, you know, in any way that we are also romantically engaged. Yeah. In in the office we're really two separate professionals yeah that's it like we could be we could have no relation we could be just friends we could be anything yeah in the office we are two professionals and we bring in two different perspectives and and that's really really important yeah equally on that side though is you have to try to find time where you're not (laughs) co-founders <laughs> exactly like <laughs> oh honey let's sit down for dinner so uh what happened with that investment today exactly that was, exactly, it's exactly. Like, no no we have to separate that and give space for our lives yeah as well, no and i think to be honest i think that side is is harder so for me <laughs> i understand it sounds silly because no, you know I I probably I a lot of people it. would say oh but you're working with your your boyfriend girlfriend husband wife whatever and you see that person that you you know I don't know, spend a Friday night with, whatever. Yeah. But it isn't like that. I mean, I, I really admire him as a professional and we have really a lot of respect for each other. That's so important. Yeah, I, and you, you need to, so... Yeah. Because otherwise it, it doesn't work. Yeah, because how would you take their opinions on board if you didn't exactly. have a deep respect? Yeah. Yeah. Fully. Um, I, th- I think rather that the other side is what you have to be careful with is... Oh, on one hand, it's quite common that anyway, a lot of things that couples speak about is what are what are things going on in their work lives. So yeah. you talk about it naturally a lot. Now that happens to be kind of the same thing. But yeah. I think the, the, the area that really helps is that this is a passion project. So I never feel bad about talking. So we, I mean, obviously, of course, we on and honestly, we do spend a lot of our dinners talking about what you would say, call work but it isn't it doesn't feel like work it is an exciting conversation it's not something that bothers me or or bothers him and as long as it's like that I think it's it's something that can work I mean it's something that we love so talking about work can also be okay that gallery was great what what do you think of that artist how can we bring them forward on the on the platform what do you think of these collectors that we spoke with how can we you know improve that and so having those conversations are great so you know it's 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 a strange one because you say oh but then you are speaking only about work but when it's your passion you know it it doesn't take it doesn't take energy from you it it gives you energy yeah. which yeah. sounds maniac but <laughs> I, I feel like anyone who is listening in who works in the arts can, it completely resonates with them yeah because it's the same thing with me when I I mean goodness I'm sitting here on a Saturday yeah coming and recording <laughs> this you know this podcast that I started just because I I, I love it yeah and because I yeah. love the arts and I want to do something to contribute to it yeah so you're officially yeah. working now yeah, but for kinda. me this is <laughs> yeah but for me this is this is an amazing Saturday. Yeah, right? this is exactly. a great weekend. Yeah, and then I'm gonna pop to a gallery later or yeah. a museum yeah. or do a studio visit. And I think that's why, when you go into the arts, I feel like at least for me personally, it has been such a joy to work so mm-hmm. hard to get to a certain point where I feel like okay, this is this is really turning into something yeah. career wise because I learned very young. I went to just a little like quick detour. I I went to a business school when when I went to high school Mm -hmm. in Austria when I moved. And I went there for three years until I decided to change schools where I then had art history and fell in love with it. So, (laughs) but I went to this business school and I I hated it. I hated every second of it. And then I worked in retail for a large part of of my teenage years. And I hated it. (laughs) <laughs> like there were so many things where I was like, I don't want to have to get up every day and not yeah. love my job. Yeah. yeah. And then I decided, well, you know, so many people were like, well, how are you going to make money? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> if you go into it with that type of mindset, then no, I'm, I'm not going to be making any money. I'm not going to be successful. But 
I have had so much fun mm. studying in the in the arts and studying the the cultural industries and and learning and working working at Sotheby's for the past four years and and while finishing my degrees and then doing projects and curating and writing and and all of these amazing diverse things that you can do in the arts and you're always engaging with culture and with other yeah. people and with how people think and feel and act and yeah. and see and it's such a marvelous thing that I completely understand when you say actually when you're working towards something you love it doesn't feel that much like work it's not yeah. like we're coming home and talking about the accounting or the or the yeah, exactly. I don't know the case that you're currently working on as a lawyer yeah and it's, it's different it's, yeah and you know it's not like we figured out a great way to make a new I don't know water bottle or sneaker which you know if, if yeah. that's your passion fine but it, yeah, it, it isn't mine it's great because that you know, could be creative or yeah but like this is so the what I love about the arts is that it's so so varied. Yeah. So there are so many impressions to take in. Oh, so many, yeah. And which I find it makes it so fulfilling um, as an as an industry to be to be involved with. And I think also now, so I've never worked this much in my life as <laughs> now, but I've never been as happy. Yeah. Either fully. So I completely under like that resonates with me <laughs> so much, so much. And yeah. you know, I, I and I left, I left a career in, in financial services. I had yeah. to go on to to be an entrepreneur. It is a big step. So uh, I mean, it's it's not an equation that sits well with with most people. And I think I mean, entrepreneurship is very much glamorized. So. I think nowadays people see it on, on Instagram and you're quote unquote an entrepreneur and you're living your life on Bali and and, and working from your laptop uh, with a um, paradise drink in your hand. But it's it's <laughs> not like that. No. Um, so it takes a lot of grit to, to try to do it. But I think the whole point is you have to do something that you, you love and I, I mean super passionate about yeah. art so that makes it it makes it something more yeah you said that you've never worked more in your life but you've never been happier so what does a normal day of an entrepreneur or of a COO of a company look like so I I get this question quite a few times and you know, as much as I would like to say that I'm uh, one of those Okay, yes, I wear wake up at four thirty AM. Oh yeah, the four thirty AM club God. with a smoothie and a workout. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, and the only fresh berries and then I'm doing my <laughs> half hour face mask and while I'm answering emails somehow <laughs> as a machine. Um Yeah, no I mean it's 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 pretty much chaos. <laughs> no, no, but you know, I think so I'm not one of those people who can do the the 4:30 a.m. Um, I I think you have to find something that works for you. So for some people this 4:30 works, and and maybe I'll arrive there at some point. But right now I think it's about making sure that you live well. Like you have to to be able to perform in your work and to do to deliver the things you have to do you have to be mentally well yeah and doing that means different things for different people so for me for example exercise is hugely important so yeah. that's something that I have to have regularly in my schedule again it doesn't mean that I'm waking up 4 30 to to run 10 kilometers yeah um but it has to be a regular thing in my in my agenda and um, then as a, as a CEO, the the thing is you do you do everything. So I look at everything from yeah from our accounting to financials to commercial um, to our legal agreements, um, working with our suppliers with our customers. Um, so the streams are are many, and and my to do list is is ever growing. Sometimes it shrinks a little bit and I'm quite happy, <laughs> but then it'll mushroom again. So in terms of, of, of what an average day looks like, it's, it's hard to say because uh, it's always changing. But that's also what I love about it, right? So no, no day, 
looks the same. And I think this is the beauty of being in a startup. So whether also for me, but I th- I believe also for, for our team is no day is the same. You're not siloed or segmented into doing this one thing. Yeah. Well, probably that was more how my life was before. Also still there, though, I was doing a lot of research. So the things were, were quite different. But you have those kind of standing elements that you do a lot while running in a, while running a startup. You're exposed to so many different things. Yeah. And you have to learn them. Yeah. So it's OK. We have to build a landing page. Oh, God, I've never built a landing page. Okay, let's let's read a bit how to do it, what works, do a bit of research. Okay, now let's let's do it. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is kind of the approach you have to have to have. Um so so yeah, no, we're working a lot. Um I don't have a set agenda as such over over my day, but I think there are those few elements that are non non-negotiable, let's say. And I think it's important to have them and you know, equally for for us as as a, as co-founders, you know, we, we have to be mindful of having those moments where you try to detach, yeah, from work. You try to do other things, but equally, a lot of times those things still involve the arts. So do make the time to go to galleries. Do make the time to see exhibitions. Um, go to cultural institutions, which I think is great. So that's it's detaching from okay, we have to do the the VAT returns for this quarter <laughs> to, 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 you know, going to a gallery. It's a, it's a great breath of fresh air, which again, yeah, is... in comparison to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, there are things you have to, you have to do them and, yeah. and, and they get done. But I also love it because I'm learning so much, so in, incredibly much about what it means to, to run a business, working with, with other people, building building a team seeing that team develop and change which has been which has been great which is what I love about this experience yeah so what piece of advice would you give someone who wants to go in that direction to achieve the same thing be an entrepreneur and and start Mm -hmm. a company and start to scale that one thing that helped me a lot was and I, I would encourage a lot of people who are exploring this kind of uh, avenue to take is 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 getting involved with a, with an accelerator or with some kind of entrepreneurial program. So what I did some years ago at this point, I was um, with the Startup Leadership Program, which is actually a global um, non for profit organization where you know it's a it's a program that helps you kind of become an entrepreneur, but it's much it's much more focused about developing you as a person rather than necessarily being fixated on your startup idea. So a lot of the things are, of course, around that, but equally it's about developing that kind of mindset that you need to pursue an entrepreneurial project. And that has been great so that... Um, that group in particular is very, very supportive. And, you know, through them, I have contact with, with entrepreneurs in in New York, in, in Hyderabad, in, uh, you know, across the globe. And, you know, we can lean on, lean on each other for anything. So we have a WhatsApp group. So everyone is asking, okay, I have this, it can be an accounting problem, or do you know a good UX designer? And we can share resources. So also one thing one thing was yeah okay it opens your eyes to what it means to be an entrepreneur you hear about the common problems because again it goes back to this idea of entrepreneurship being quite glamorized yeah. and it seems quite simple while it isn't and a lot of people go through a lot of hardship from it so this kind of also to an extreme can be also entrepreneurial depression because you you feel anything from imposter syndrome to oh my god I'm trying to run this company and I have now responsibility for all these people with this very risky project and you know you're um, a lot of times you're also making a loss for quite a bit of time and you have to try to make ends meet and those mean very tough decisions yeah and and those take a big toll on you and but those things are things that we don't really talk about so no. much so when you look at 
and an entrepreneur. Again, the, the vision that comes in your mind is this guy under the palm tree in Bali. It's not like that. And like there are a lot of difficult things that you go through. So I think one, being aware of it, explore things where you can learn more about it. So being involved in, in an accelerator, do like some kind of program just to see what does it mean and also hear from other people. And then from there, you have more a foundation to make, let's say, an educated decision yeah. to yeah. see if it's something that works for you. And, but then and then the, the last point is don't be necessarily afraid to try either. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you do that thinking, do the research ahead, really have a clear idea what you want to do, read about the market, what is are people doing, what are what are your kind of competitors for this idea, where can you carve a space for yourself and try to maintain that. If you figure those two, three, four puzzle pieces out, then you should just try to go for it. Yeah. But I think it's really important to do that research before, because again, from the outside world is like, okay, I'm just going to quit my job and do this project and I'm sure it's going to work. And I'll be my own boss and it'll exactly. be grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it'll be so great. But a lot of times it's it's much more than that. Completely. I, I don't think I can equate launching a podcast to having a startup and launching a company. However, no, but still, there goes a lot to it. It's, yeah. Okay. What do I want it to look like? What kind of materials do I need? You sit here now with nice microphones, and you have. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you learned a lot about even just the technological oh side of it. I'm so bad with technology, and so having to learn <laughs> how to like edit on GarageBand has been like the bane of my existence. <laughs> but, but I'm sure now you could basically teach a course on it. On the other hand, yeah. Yeah, probably, so, probably. <laughs> so even there, you've learned a lot in this process. And also, like, how do I work with Spotify? What's the difference? Spotify yeah. music, Apple music. How do I reach my audience? What can they, what would they want to listen to? So there's a lot that you learn and they go into. And I think that's nice because you feel yourself growing. Yeah. And I think that's exactly the crux of it is growth because yeah. when I first launched the podcast, it was also it was kind of like a lockdown thing and it was mm -hmm. for myself. It was like yeah. I'm doing this because I feel so far away from the arts. I was studying arts administration and cultural policy, but I wasn't as engaged as I was when I was studying art history or going to museums or being able to see the exhibitions that were on at Sotheby's. I yeah. really just missed that. And so that's why I decided to go into it. And now I've grown it and I've really found the purpose of it through yeah. continuing it a bit. The career aspect and encouraging growth of the sector was always a part of it. Mm -hmm. But now I've really found this is this is it. This is what it's for. This is yeah. what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to grow the arts and cultural sector through information and lived yeah. experiences that other people can provide who are doing just that. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that has grown, even though in the beginning I was like, oh, well, this is if no one listens to it, then no one listens to it. And all of a yeah. sudden, you know, I'm working with Artscapey and I'm, I'm working with, with other companies and, and other people and, and yeah. artists and, and it's marvelous and it's become yeah. something. But it takes time to arrive there as well. Yeah. I think this is a, also an overlooked thing that it takes a lot of perseverance much more than that you get that exposure but it takes time also equally for 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 artscapey i mean you know it takes some time until you start to achieve that kind of resonance from the from the market or from from people who could be interested so it takes time to build that yep exactly and there are so many things that i also hope to be to be achieving in 2022 and 2023 to go outside of just the podcasting, mm -hmm. but also within the all about art sphere of encouraging more engagement within arts and culture. Yeah. Um, and it's just so many things that, that I hope to be achieving with it. But are there any future plans that Artscapey has that you can divulge with me here today? Um, well, so I think we have a few exciting projects going on. So one is where we're proud to be sponsoring London Art Fair, um, which has now been postponed actually to April. Yeah. And I think this will be a great way for us to also interact more directly with the, with the art world. So being with collectors, with galleries, 
Uh, so this is a very exciting project that we have going on. There are a few more along these lines that, you know, as, they, as and when they are confirmed, we I'm happy to share them. But yeah. now, <laughs> for now, they are, are in conversation. But yeah. th- these kind of projects and ideas and, and, you know, we're working also directly with with some artists. So one thing that we're doing now, I mentioned a bit the the blockchain side of things. So so our key focus is always on the fine arts. Yeah. Um and one one thing that we're extremely proud of doing is uh, is a collaboration with uh, with an Italian artist, uh Filippo Rignolo. We're collaborating with him to do an NFT of his performance work. Of his performance work. Yes, yes. So cool. this this project is quite it's it's a very very somber and, and heavy topic mm-hmm. but it's a it's a very nice piece of work so this performance uh, originally took place in Rome at the at the Maxi Museum uh, on the 16th uh, of October last year which is the same day that in 1943 the the Roman ghetto was was moved into so the the Jews there were moved into to Auschwitz. Mm. So the the performance is basically connected to this. So what happened at the time was the the general was deciding essentially who got to live and die yeah. through a very very simple hand gesture, so a motion between left and right. He was moving this this piece of paper basically. Oh gosh. And so what Rignolo then does is superimposing the way we interact with digital devices and social media today, mm-hmm. where the same kind of banality of a gesture lets us connect back to this thing of how how banal that decision was at the time yeah. and how it is it is almost it's a way for us to connect that past mm. into into our present day into our into our future for us to to feel the extremity of that kind of horror with also how we we make even decisions today how we interact with with devices yeah um and so this basically interactive artwork is becoming is becoming an nft so where you can basically explore and feel how this this work was was performed so you have this basically this simple motion um where you where you explore this this event essentially so we're releasing this later in in january basically on the day that those jews that were still alive at the time were were released which uh, out of the 1022 were only eight so we are we're very proud to be able to collaborate with such a great project yeah so for us for artscapey our key focus is always quality fine art so we're extremely proud to be able to work with such an impactful yeah. piece and artist who's exactly. working with such a strong and important message message uh, yeah yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, this, you know, obviously on a much, much less light tone than an art fair, but I think it's great for us to be able to collaborate with such profound yeah. work and But this and is thoughts. why the arts are important. Because exactly. Because it does tackle these themes in a way that, that communicates to people and touches people and influences people. And that's what makes it so impactful. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So mm. yeah, we're really, really proud to be doing that. We are working with with other art fairs now. We're bringing on uh, new and different uh, galleries mm-hmm. to help to promote their their programs, exploring other collaborations with with artists. Mm-hmm. Um, so those things are are now taking shape, and we're very very happy for that. And I mean, I would I would invite. Also, every every listener to have a look at the the site. I mean, it's very it's free to have an account. So yeah. this is one thing again that goes back to our ethos of being all for collectors. So yeah. we wanted to make we want to make it accessible. So 
I mean, you can you can even start logging a collection so up to twenty five pieces is free. Yep. Um, which for us was was hugely important to be that accessible entry point um, and or growth point. So for someone who is interested in art and want to explore, want to learn whether or not you have that art academic background to make it accessible. Yeah. So the more things that we are exploring is is direct interactions with uh, with people who are interested in art, with with collectors. Yeah. Um, we'll be doing other probably exhibitions as we as we go along mm-hmm. and and you know different collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and if people end up going to the to the website to then sign up. I also wrote an article for Artscapey. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. so my, a piece of my writing is also on the website and you can go and check out some of the things that I had to say about some of the pieces yeah. that could possibly be really wonderful pieces to add to any you know collector's portfolio. And I think that's also there where you see so what we're really trying to bring in yeah. is some different works of research so across different topic areas different different medium uh but also an, as a at an accessible price point so again yeah. back to this idea of you don't have to have hundreds of thousands in the bank to be able to support the art world yeah because it's not what it's about but few people know this so yeah. we want to help um make people more more aware access that kind of information which i think is great how that aligns also with the things that you're trying to do so help people explore art because it yep. should be I mean that's also what artists want so yeah exactly so finally a bit of a fun one to end the episode yeah if you could pick one artwork from art history or even from now whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to add to your collection what artwork would it be so I mean I I have to go I mean, for better or worse, I have to go cheesy on this one. So <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite artworks, I mean, since since before I, I even was, let's say, more more aware of the arts, uh, even is is um, is The Kiss by Klimt. Ah. <laughs> Hopeless romantic, you know, all that, <laughs> all that jazz and, and, you know, that just that innerliness yeah. of this piece of work and the 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 intimacy and the not just not just the the love but the intimacy also of of humans the connections between humans that that work for me kind of represents and it's always been there in the in the back of my back of my mind in some sense yeah it is i i think he's a he's a great artist and 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 that piece in particular uh, is is probably my favorite. So yeah. So if I could, if I could steal it and and have it, yeah, <laughs> steal it from the. Where is it? I think it's. Where is the kiss right now? Is it in the Leopold in Vienna? I think so. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're speaking to an Austrian. So exactly. Of course, Gustav Klimt is. Yeah, I love Gustav Klimt and Viennese modernism and 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 all of that. It's marvelous. All right. Well, that is it from me. And so. Amelia, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Alexander. This has been great. Thank you so much. And that is it for today on All About Art. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave me a rating or a review as it helps more people discover the show. Also, feel free to share with your friends or if you share on social media, tag me and get in touch. Thank you so much for listening.